let me ask all the audience to turn off their video and mute themselves to save on bandwidth. We will ask questions at the end of the presentation. But as Ellie, uh, I, I think Ellie allows clarificatory questions. So if you have some during the webinar, then you can just unmute yourself and ask your questions or raise your virtual hand. If you want to type in your questions, we have the chat box. So I will monitor the questions in the chat box. You can also type in your questions there. We will be recording this webinar for documentation purposes only, but Ellie has graciously agreed to disseminate the recording of this webinar. So for those who want to have a copy, just email the research office or me. And um, we have Dr. Ellie Remolona, who is a professor of finance at the Asian School of Business. And he has spent most of his career in central banking, 14 years at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, 19 years at the Bank of International Settlements in Basel in Hong Kong. He has taught at Williams College, Columbia University, New York University, and the UP School of Economics. He holds a PhD in economics from Stanford University. So let's all have a virtual round of applause to our speaker, Dr. Eli Rimulong. Take it away, Eli. Uh, magandang umaga po sa inyo lahat. Uh, good morning. Um, so whenever I give a seminar at the UP School of Economics, it feels like uh, coming home. Uh, so thank you, Carl, for uh, inviting me to do the seminar. And thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us in this seminar. Uh, I would be happy to take uh, clarifying questions, especially because I know that uh, there are people here who know more about these things than I do. Uh, so today, as you can see, I'm going to talk about the quandary of digital payments. And I'm going to talk about this, especially from the perspective of central banks. As you know, the digital payments have uh, captured our imagination, including uh, academics, the uh, imagination of academics. And uh, this sometimes forces them to try to say something intelligent about, uh, about blockchain, about digital payments. So that's what I'm doing. And this is also what uh, someone else has done. Let me just quote this person. Uh, this is Neil Ferguson, a best-selling British historian. He said, U.S. policymakers need to wake up to the potential of digital currency and electronic payments and the peril of allowing China to dominate them. Uh, so he sounds as if he knows what he's talking about, doesn't he? At the end of this uh, seminar, you can decide for yourself whether he actually does. So let me just uh, divide this talk into uh, the three parts. First, I want to talk about what I call a tug of war between tokens and accounts. This is basically to remind ourselves of what was going on before the advent of blockchain. And then I want to talk about uh, what I call Nakamoto's wizardry. Nakamoto is a guy who uh, who uh, proposed uh, Bitcoin. Uh, I'm going to talk about that wizardry meeting uh, the Buterin trilemma. The trilemma identifies kind of flaw in uh, Nakamoto's proposal. And um, it's an issue whether that flaw is uh, just kind of a fly in, in the ointment, small flaw, or is it or whether it's a fatal flaw. So we'll see. And, uh, see uh, what you think. And then finally, I want to talk about a solution in search of a problem. That's what that's how I see uh, a blockchain. It's, that's how central banks see blockchain. It's a brilliant solution. But how do we then use it? So that's, uh, that's the outline of my talk. Um, this tug of war between tokens and accounts uh, actually started about 350 years ago. In, uh, 17, in the 17th century, uh, merchants in London would store their gold with goldsmiths. Gold was the currency of the time. They would store the gold with goldsmiths. 
who in turn would issue promissory notes uh, without the full backing of gold. So the volume of the promissory notes would exceed the actual amount of gold in the vaults of the goldsmiths. This was what you we now call the fractional reserve banking. So the bankers in the old days in London were goldsmiths. And then in 1695, a new bank a new bank, the Bank of England, uh, just formed by Act of Parliament, started to issue bank notes payable on demand. So this is our uh, our initial uh, token based system. It's called a token because it doesn't have to come with your identity. It's uh, you can you can pay with it uh, without revealing your identity, without anyone having to know who you are. And then in 1773, uh, we, we had the start of an account-based system. This time, the banks or the, the goldsmiths in those days would meet at Five Bells Tavern. This was a tavern a few blocks from the Bank of England. They would meet there to clear checks. So they would exchange checks and then credit accounts and debit some accounts. In this way, they were serving essentially as what we now call trusted third parties. Now, it's important to know that uh, being a trusted third party was, uh, was a big responsibility. You, don't, you not only had to maintain accurate accounts of uh, who owes what, you had to stay solvent. Uh, you had to know how to manage credit risk those days and you had to stay liquid because this was a fractional reserve system you really didn't have reserves in your vault to uh, to redeem a large amount of withdrawals so you had to know how to manage liquidity risk so that was the beginning of a token based system and an account based system and these things evolved uh, over time so by the 20th century um, you had the account based uh, the account based system dominating the payment system the account based system what uh, was the original five bells system divided itself into wholesale and retail parts the retail part we kind of know we're kind of familiar with the retail part uh, and here i'm giving an example from china the retail part is, you know, you go to the store. If you were in China, you would use either Alipay or WeChat Pay. And then Alipay and WeChat Pay is what we call uh, payment service providers. They would have uh, accounts at the banks, and then they uh, there would be some kind of interbank clearing involving those banks. That was that's the existing retail uh, retail uh, system. And it's mostly account based. Uh -huh. And then we also have uh, what you call the wholesale system. And this is the system that uh, involves payments between, uh, between, uh, between big investors, between securities uh, institutions. And this involved, uh, this mainly involved uh, uh, what we call uh, RTGS. Uh, which is the real-time growth settlement system. So this is the part of it that's, uh, I think, rem the most remarkable part of the payment system is that it's the RTGS, and yet we know, I think we know so little about it. So let me uh, explain what the RTGS system is. This is, as I said, the wholesale part of the account-based system. Uh, I think this is underappreciated, but it's a remarkable achievement of digital payments. And I would say it has a lot more to it. Uh, the first RTGS system was Fedwire. And this was launched in 1970. Today, Fedwire uh, processes over $3 trillion a day in final and irrevocable payments. It's used mainly for delivery versus payment of securities. So you get the securities, 
uh, only when you make the payment and the guy who gets the payment only gets the payment only after delivering the securities. And this all happens through the books of the, all of this happens through the books of the, of the Fed. This is open, uh, this, this system is open 21 and a half hours a day. So it's open from, uh, from uh, 9.30 at night to 6 the following day, 6 in the evening the following day. So 20, 21 and a half hours. It's used by 7,000 participants, all of them known by the Fed. And then the Fed also provides a backup liquidity, which is critical because very often computers, uh, you know, they, uh, they have a glitch. And then you need, uh, you need backup. We have the same system in the Philippines. We are, it's called PhilPass. Uh, in fact, there's, PhilPass is one of uh, 90 systems, 90 RTGS systems in the world. If you're a significant uh, economy, you need RTGS. In the Philippines, it's called PhilPass. In the Eurozone, it's called Target 2. In China, it's called Synapse or Snaps. And in Mexico, it's called uh, SPEI. Sistema de Pagos Electronicos Interbarcarios. So this is the, I, I'd say this is kind of a, the gold standard uh, for uh, the current, the current uh, payment system. Let me say a little bit about the retail part as it stands. Uh, again, I'm going to give you the example of China. That symbol on the left, that's uh, the symbol of, uh, that's the logo of the People's Bank of China. And the People's Bank of China issues paper money. We now call a token. Uh, it's not attached to anybody's identity. That's still being used, but less and less. Maybe 5% of uh, retail payments use uh, paper money. And then you still have uh, this, uh, you still have credit cards. Uh, you still have, uh, and these credit cards go to a payment service providers, uh, and they go to a bank. They mostly use uh, what is called NFC. That, that's a technology called uh, near field communication. You wave the card in front of a device and that's how you pay. That's the main, that's a dominant form of payment uh, in Malaysia, for example. In the States, by the way, you still stick your card into a, a device. So the States is far behind when it comes to retail. But the dominant <coughs> payment mechanism is a QR code. And there are two QR, there are two systems for the QR code. There's Alipay and there's WeChat Pay. Between the two systems, they account for over 90% of all the retail payments in China. As I said, they still go to banks and the banks do this interbank clearing. In the experience of China, the QR code is the superior technology compared to the near field communication, for example, any other retail, retail payment mechanism. Um, so this is, uh, this is where it stands, but something, there's something interesting about the Chinese system. They have Alipay and then we have Pay, but those two systems don't talk. If you have an Alipay card, or if you have Alipay on your, on your phone, you go to stores that accept Alipay. If you have WeChat Pay on your phone, you go to stores that accept uh, uh, WeChat Pay. Uh, they're not interoperable. So that's something that is, uh, is, that is not making the People's Bank of China happy. You have two very efficient systems, but they, they have their own ecosystems that don't talk to each other. So that's where we stand uh, when it comes to uh, retail payments. Should I stop, Carl, for a minute or so in case there are questions? Yeah, sure, Andy. Uh, if there are any questions at this point, uh, you, can, you can voice them out or put them in the chat. I guess there are none, Ellie. I guess in the Philippines we have uh, GCash and we have Paymaya. And they're somewhat more uh, interoperable than uh, than the case in uh, than it's in the case in China. 
that the Chinese are very upset about this. Uh, I think it was done on purpose by Alipay not to uh, not to accommodate Michat Pay and vice versa. They want to purposely try to create their own ecosystems, hoping that their ecosystem will, uh, will turn out uh, more successful. Let me now turn to the issue of the day, which is blockchain. <coughs> so here's uh, here's the landscape of. Uh, the main cryptocurrencies by market capitalization. Bitcoin, uh, the total estimate for uh, the market cap of all the cryptocurrencies in the world is something like $2.4 trillion. Bitcoin by itself is about 44% of this. Bitcoin is about a trillion dollars now. Uh, and then you have Ethereum, which is about $400 billion, 17% of the, the total. You have Binance, Binance Coin. This is a new one. Last year, it wasn't in the top five, about 4%. You have Dogecoin, uh, 3%, XRP, 3%. Uh, number six is something called the Tether, which is a stable coin, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So when Bitcoin was launched in... Uh, 2009, central banks uh, did not really notice because central banks were uh, busy dealing with the crisis that was still raging in 2009. But I would say with the crisis going on, Bitcoin came at the right time because this was a time, as, as you can imagine, a time of suspicion about uh, the competence of the government and the competence of the system, competence of the central bank. Bitcoin was nice seen as something that might be a better system than what we had in place in 2000, 2009. This is a picture of the price of Bitcoin over the last year since uh, May 2020. As you can see, nothing much happened in the second half of 2020, but uh, starting in 2021, you see a uh, the price of Bitcoin suddenly go up. You had this mini bubble in January, January, and then uh, the bubble burst. And then you had another big uh, rise, spectacular increase in prices since February. This is the time that Elon Musk uh, jumped in. What he, he bought, I think he bought uh, $1.5 billion for Bitcoin. And then he uh, disclosed the transaction to the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. And that's how everyone found out. And immediately the, the price of uh, Bitcoin uh, jumped 16%, continued rising. So over the year, uh, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin price uh, rose by a multiple of six times. Six times over a year, so that's uh, that's very impressive, uh, very impressive return. Um, so this is why everyone's so excited about uh, Bitcoin. Uh, Robert Schiller has a new book. I don't know if you can see me, but uh, it's called uh, Narrative Economics. Chapter one is about Bitcoin. Uh, so he talks about uh, events that caused the narrative of uh, Bitcoin to, uh, to spread like a pandemic. And he says one of the things that makes Bitcoin so appealing is uh, because the, the founder is so mysterious. Let me talk about the founder a little bit. Any questions, by the way, about, um, about this so far? Art? Uh, there are none so far. Oh, is there a question? Uh, Yes, can you identify yourself? I'm Rolly Valenzuela. Okay. Uh, uh, former chief economist of the Bankers Association Philippines and BPI. Oh. I just yeah. want to ask Dr. Repolona. Uh, by the way, we were roommates uh, when we were teaching fellows at the School of <laughs> Economics. And uh, he oh. was there in an afro uh, hair. Uh, my question is uh, about this uh, trilemma. And uh, what would be the optimal trade-off between security oh between uh, your scalability and, of course, uh, 
the other criteria, as you said, is uh, the uh, the third one, uh, which is uh, your decentralization. Because uh, it is given, Dr. Remulona, that we must have a layer of security first before you can yes, talk yes. about scaling it to so many transactions per second. Or maybe, like, like uh, the, uh, you know, when you talk about Visa card, they're talking about so many thousands uh, transactions per second. Yes, yes. But in a blockchain, probably you're talking of millions as a potential. Okay, but uh, if you were now the user, like me, I use regularly, uh, you know, mobile banking and all of these, uh, you know, retail payments and uh, transfer of funds through Instapay. Uh, what would be that ideal trade-off in terms of measurable trade-off? in terms of the three objectives to achieve scalability, uh, to achieve security and centralization. That, that's, like uh, what would be the medium yeah. of defense that's when uh, it comes to what would be the nuclear hard defense and how many transactions per second and what would be the degree of participation in this uh, blockchain, how many participants with permission, without permission, whatever, but in the eyes of the regulator, they would like security, and of course, uh, they would like scalability. But in your eyes, Dr. Remulana, and to, if you have a social welfare function, so to speak, if you have a utility, what would be that optimal trade-off between these three objectives? Thank you. Thank you for that question, Dr. Valenzuela. I, I think you put your finger on the single most important question. And um, I'll get to it in two slides. I'll get to it in two slides. Let me give you one more slide and then I'll get to your trilemma, uh, if, if you don't mind. Sure. Let me first try to explain the, the technology in one slide, the blockchain technology in one slide, if you don't mind, uh, before we talk about the trilemma. Um, this is what I call Nakamoto's wizardry. And this is a wizardry that is kind of... Uh, an anarchist's idea of digital money. Um, by the way, the Nakamoto paper is a wonderfully written paper. It's, uh, it's uh, very readable, so I think uh, all UP students should read it. Uh, you don't need any technical expertise to understand the, the paper. The paper is about, the proposal in the paper is about peer-to-peer -peer electronic pins without trusted third party. This paper wasn't published, which was sent by email to a few friends, but he proposed, uh, or could be a she, no one knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is, but he or she proposed uh, a payment system without trusted third party. Now, this was a uh, I think this is a brilliant uh, proposal, but as in the case of many brilliant papers, it stood on the shoulders of, uh, of giants in the computer literature. One giant, uh, Haber and Stornetta, or two giants if you include uh, Nicole or Stornetta, was about time stamping. This, the, the essence of this is really the same as the essence of uh, when you're buying precious art in the market. You have to know the provenance of that art. You, you have to know where it came from, uh, who sold it to whom, and so on. That's to guarantee that it's the real thing, it's, uh, it's real art. In the, case of, uh, in the case of Bitcoin, Nakamoto worried about whether there is a transaction uh, the Bitcoin is assigned to one Bitcoin address and then uh, it's spent and then the same guy tries to spend it again, tries to sell it to someone else. Uh, he, that's called a double spend issue. And to prevent that, you have to know the whole history of uh, transactions. It's called timestamp. Um, Nakamoto says the only way to confirm the absence of a uh, transaction, which is the transaction to have to spend the Bitcoin before and then to spend it again. The only way to avoid that is to be aware of all transactions. 
this timestamping business is a way to record all the transactions over time in, in a chain. That's why it's called a chain. Uh, and once it's recorded, it can't be changed. You can add to it, you can append to the chain, but you cannot change anything that came, came before. And that's a way to make sure that there is no, no double spend. The second uh, set of giants were Lamport, Shosta, and Peace. And these are the guys who uh, formulated the Byzantine General's problem. This is a problem of coordination when you were your messaging system is not very reliable. So they were talking about coordinating uh, an attack in a town by several generals. When some of the generals are naughty or not, not loyal generals, you don't know whether uh, they'll do what they're supposed to do. So you have to find a way to coordinate in the presence of, uh, in the case of Bitcoin, naughty notes. The notes are the computers that are involved in, uh, in blockchain. And somehow you have to validate the transaction when some of the nodes are not, uh, not loyal, or not reliable. The Lamport Shosta and Peace uh, paper, uh, the conclusion of the paper was you need two thirds of the nodes to be loyal nodes. This is kind of weird because uh, Nakamoto did, uh, did not want a trusted third party. But it turns out to solve the coordination problem, you needed the uh, two thirds majority of the nodes to be trustworthy. So no trusted third party, but you need a majority, a two thirds majority to be trustworthy. So that's uh, Lamport Shosta and Peace. But here's the stroke of genius in, um, in Nakamoto. He then, uh, incorporated a third, uh, third, uh, I would say a third giant. This is Adam Back in 2002. This is the proof of work idea of Adam Back. Our proof of work is about communication in which you have to do some work in making the communication to make, and that would make the communication more credible this uh, this proof of work uh, makes the, the Byzantine general's problem more solvable. You no longer need a two-thirds majority. You just need, you, with the proof of work, you need a simple majority. This is what you, and what you get is money by consensus. So the time stamping gives you money by mem money as memory, and then the, the proof of work, uh, along with the solution to uh, what is really a Byzantine general's problem is, uh, it's what gives you money by consensus. So this is the basis of blockchain. And it has worked uh, in the sense that uh, very hard to, uh, to fake it and, uh, and the coordination happens uh, very regularly. Now the flaw, so, so, so Dr. Valenzuela indicated, is that this proof of work process is very, very costly in terms of computer computer power in terms of CPU. It's a very costly costly process. Um, so that today uh, you can look this up today. It is updated every day. Um, it takes block. Uh, Bitcoin can process uh, no more than four point six bitcoins uh, per second. 4.66 bitcoins per second is pathetic. Visa can process, I think, 1,700 transactions per second. So compared to Visa, uh, Bitcoin is really, really slow. And then it costs about $20 per transaction. So the cost of a transaction in Bitcoin is about six cappuccino grandes at Starbucks. So you won't be using a Bitcoin to buy to go to Starbucks. You have to use it to uh, for a for a very big uh, big transaction. So that's uh, that's the flaw in Bitcoin, and we don't know whether it's just a small flaw, a fly in the ointment, so to speak, or a fatal flaw. So that's where the debate stands, and this debate uh, can be can be. Um, 
described in terms of a trilemma. The trilemma was uh, described first by a guy named uh, Vitalik Buterin. So that's why it's called the, tri the Buterin trilemma. I think uh, Mr. Bowser, who's in the audience, can tell you who this guy is. This guy is a Russian-Canadian uh, computer programming. He's a celebrity in Canada. And he was part of Bitcoin in the beginning, and then he left and formed, uh, uh, and formed uh, the other, the other, uh, the other cryptocurrency. Here. He formed the uh, Ethereum. So here's the trilemma. You have three things that. Uh, that you could have for, uh, for a cryptocurrency. Uh, only two of them are achievable. And you could have security and decentralization. Remember, this is what, uh, what uh, Nakamoto wanted. He wanted peer-to-peer, -peer, which means decentralized, uh, no central authority. Or you could have security and scalability. But you cannot have all three at the same time. You cannot have security, decentralization, and scalability at the same time. Bitcoin, or the cryptocurrencies, have chosen to do security and decentralization. They're not scalable because of this proof-of-work process. It's very hard to scale them up. It becomes very expensive. Even now, they're already very expensive. Uh, well, central banks, I would say, have chosen security and scale, scalability, and I'll show you what they've been doing about that. As I said, uh, you can't have all three. That's, uh, that's the trilemma. Not to say that there haven't, there haven't been efforts to do all three. I think the biggest effort so far is, uh, is the Libra. We'll talk about the Libra for a minute. Uh, Libra was uh, 2019. It was proposed by uh, by an uh, association led by uh, led by Facebook. So it had credibility, and this is what uh, was the real wake up call for central banks. Uh, they thought Libra might actually work. So the thing about Libra is you don't have complete decentralization. The validation of the transaction is based on a small association, 22 members. Uh, uh, that's why it's called, called the permission blockchain. It's not, not everybody can join the, what in cryptocurrency world, in the cryptocurrency world is, are the miners. So here, you don't have a million miners the way you do for Bitcoin. You have 22 members of an association who will validate the transaction. And then with the permission blockchain, you have up to, the, at least uh, Libra promises up to 1,000 transactions per second. It's a big improvement on Bitcoin, which is only 4.6 transactions. But you lose that decentralization. Because now you have, uh, instead of uh, everybody without permission being able to join, you now have an association, 22 members, deciding whether the transaction is valid or not. <clears throat> and they wanted to, uh, this Libra wanted to achieve more than that. So they, they not only wanted uh, more efficient to, for the thing to have a stable value. As you can see from the graph of Bitcoin, it's a very volatile, uh, the value is very volatile. Uh, very volatile, although people like the fact that at least it's going up. And here they wanted to maintain the stability of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what is called a stable coin. This is done by having a reserve fund, a backup fund with uh, that's holding liquid assets. Kind of the same thing that uh, the, the Hong Kong dollar stability is maintained. The Hong Kong Monetary Authority is a huge reserves of US dollars, maintain the stability of them. Now, something seems to have uh, happened to uh, Libra. Don't hear about it anymore. 
the Libra Association itself renamed themselves the Deem Association. And uh, they seem to be scaling back uh, their plans. They have a license in Switzerland. The association is now based in Geneva. Swiss regulatory authorities have given them a license to uh, issue their uh, stable coin, but nothing has happened so far. There's no stable, there's no Libra that's being traded. Uh, so it's still, uh, still in the works and we don't know whether it could ever. So this was an attempt to round off the corners of the trilemma and we don't know whether it could work. By the way, there are other ways to, uh, there are other proposals to solve the proof of work problem. There is uh, the Ethereum proposal, which is uh, proof of stake. Uh, they've been promising to introduce that, uh, but haven't done so. I will tell you later on about another pos possible way to solve the proof of work problem. This is, uh, this is uh, to have not a trusted third party or not a trusted intermediary, but to have a trusted auditor. There are various attempts to solve this, uh, this costly proof of work process. Dr. Valenzuela, is that um, an answer to you? You're, you're muted. You're muted. You're on, you're on mute, Crowley. Can you unmute, Crowley? We see your mouth move, but no sound is coming yeah. out. Let me see if I can find you. You're on mute, uh, you're on mute, Polly. The use of uh, Bitcoin for uh, as a medium of exchange and as a store of value. Uh, what do you think would be the right direction of regulation in as far as uh, the use, uh, access and usage of, uh, you know, Filipinos? Uh, from the elite to the less wealthy of Bitcoin, because there seems to be a need to have more literacy on this uh, particular asset. And uh, it could be a mean to broaden, you know, uh, access to various uh, financial uh, assets and even a way to diversify a investment portfolio for some uh, people. So what would be the right direction of regulation? I mean, the BIS would be in the right position, I think, to influence the, the, regulation, the regulatory trust of the BSB in as far as Bitcoin uh, access and usage and the risk management is concerned. Thank you very much, Dr. Remolo. Let me say something quickly about that. Uh, clearly, Bitcoin is not going to be a good medium of exchange because it's so expensive. Uh, each transaction is so expensive, so it's not a good medium of exchange. It's not going to be a good uh, a unit of account because the value is so unstable. But it, it's a store of value, but it's a speculative store of value. It's more of a crypto asset, a speculative crypto asset than, than, uh, than a regular asset like bonds or stocks. Um, I have friends who have bought, invested in Bitcoin, and they're very happy about, about it. But uh, they're happy about it for speculative reasons. Uh, it may be a good uh, asset for diversification purposes, in the same way that gold is sometimes a gold, good asset for the diversification problem, diversification uh, purposes. But we'll have to see. I think it hasn't been around long enough to establish its. Uh, return correlations with, uh, with other, other assets. So let me now talk about what central banks are doing in response to this. Uh, so as I said, central banks see uh, blockchain as a brilliant solution, but uh, they don't know what the problem is for this uh, solution. So it's a solution in search of a, of a problem. When it comes to problems in the payment systems, there are quite a few, but let me focus on three of them. Uh, one, as I said before, is interoperability. Uh, 
many systems in the world. Uh, you have, in a given economy, you have more than one system, but they're not interoperable. So this is kind of something that uh, is very inefficient for the payment system. And this, an example of this is the Chinese QR code system. WeChat Pay versus, uh, versus Alipay. Second is the cross-border payment system. It's, uh, it has uh, quite a few problems. Uh, first of all, uh, there's no payment versus payment mechanism, cross-border payments. You exchange dollars for pesos, you have to pay the pesos, maybe two days later you get the dollars, or vice versa. There's no mechanism for payments versus payments. You go through correspondent banks, you go through, uh, you may go through SWIFT, but there's no reliable uh, payment versus payment mechanism. What we call Kaliwaan here in the Philippines. Uh, this is why you had Herstadt in 1974. This is a German bank that failed, uh, and a lot of the, uh, the banks that had uh, exchange foreign currency with Herstadt lost their money and foreign exchange market was frozen for uh, for a few months because of the failure of Herstadt. In 2016, you had the Bangladesh Bank. This is uh, something that went through SWIFT. The SWIFT, the main communication mechanism for uh, international payments, uh, uh, did not have very good protocols. They've since changed those protocols, but uh, early in 2016, the protocols were not, were not good enough. And then, of course, when it comes to retail cross-border payments, uh, it's very expensive. If you're an OFW, you're sending money, it would be 5%. It's a big amount, it could be 5%. But many times, it's as much as 20%. It's a very expensive way to send money cross-border. It's cheaper to do it purely domestically with your uh, mobile phones, cross-border, it's very expensive. And finally, of course, you have financial inclusion. You have the, the lack of access to, to banks, which are still the backbone of the payment system. So let me just give you examples of what central banks are doing about these things. There's many, many projects by central banks. These projects are called the CBDCs. <coughs> These are uh, central bank digital currencies. And, uh, here's a few examples of CBDCs to watch. The famous one is the uh, People's Bank's uh, EU one. As I said, uh, as I mentioned, the Chinese are not happy about the fact that it's not interoperable. The, I mean, Alipay and WeChat are not interoperable interoperable. So the PBOC is introducing EU1 to make, uh, make the whole system interoperable, partly. <coughs> I'll talk about the, that project in a moment. You have the Cambodia's uh, BACOM, National Bank of Cambodia's BACOM uh, system. You know, they don't have a very good payment system in Cambodia, and the dollar is as important as the local currency. So they're introducing the BACOM for making retail pay in its sister and make it electronic to improve the payment system. Then you have uh, the India's, uh, the Reserve Bank of India's JAM Trinity, which is something they're doing for uh, purposes of financial inclusion. These things are already going on. These things are live. So they're in operation. being tested live. And then you have a whole bunch of pilot projects around the world. And the most, to me, the interesting ones include uh, a project by the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan. It's called Project Stella. Uh, this is the one that is looking to see whether they can rely on trusted auditors instead of trusted third party. I don't know whether it's better than trusted third party, but that's the idea. The BIS, uh, in collaboration with four central banks, Bank of Thailand, uh, HKMA, Hong Kong, 
People's Bank of China, Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates, they're looking at what's called the multiple CBDC bridge. So this is an attempt to have a common platform for several CBDCs in different currencies, an effort to improve the cross-border payment system. So I think this is, for now, this is going to be just wholesale, but it will solve uh, some of the big issues in cross-border payments. And finally, we have uh, the BSP. They have uh, what I think is being called the QRPH. Uh, and this seems to be part of uh, the drive uh, for financial inclusion. So let me be more, uh, provide more detail about the EU one, about uh, this multi CBDC bridge and about uh, BSP's URPH. I'm sure there will be people here who can help me about at least the BSP's uh, project. Uh, the EU one, it's going to be a hybrid system. Uh, the EU one itself will be an account-based uh, currency. It will be used as a settlement currency for, for the token-based distributed ledgers. So below the EU one, you would have a um, peer-to-peer, uh, kind of like the and then like the distributed ledgers of Bitcoin, different nodes. But above it, you have the EU one that will be used as a settlement currency so that uh, whatever it happens to be though will become uh, interoperable. The EU one itself will be used only by the top tier intermediary for settlement purposes. And then once, once it goes to the book, back, they get finality. With this thing in place, uh, the Chinese think it will allow interoperability between Alipay, WeChat Pay, other other bank intermediated system. So that's a basic idea of, uh, of the E1. It's not about conquering the world. It's not about uh, displacing the U.S. dollar. It's uh, mostly about interoperability. Anyway, that's what uh, that's what the Chinese tell me, and uh, I. I think uh, this guy in the picture is the deputy governor in charge of the project, uh, Mr. Chang Chun, Mo Chang Chun, and uh, this is the way he describes uh, the EU one project. Uh, the second project is the MCBDC bridge, the multiple CBDC bridge. Uh, as I said, this is. Uh, a joint project of uh, four central banks, the Bank of Thailand, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the People's Bank of China, Central Bank of the United Emirates, and the BIS. Uh, when the BIS is involved, then, uh, that's as if uh, all the other member central banks are involved. There are 60 central banks in the BIS, including the Fed, including the ECB, uh, the Bank of England, and so on. The idea here is to allow payments versus payments when using all this all these currencies. Uh, this will avoid hair stop to risk. Uh, as I said, the benefits are seen to be especially important for emerging markets, especially countries where uh, correspond, correspond, correspondent banking relationships are not so strong. And, uh, without access to other other mechanisms for, for risk mitigation. By the way, there has been a trend over the last several years of correspondent banks reducing their relationship with, with countries like the Philippines. So this may help uh, in, that, uh, in that situation, this project of MCBDC. The third project is uh, the BSP's project on, uh, on QRPH. I think that's what they call it. Uh, and it's part of a three-part uh, three uh, three uh, project. 
the first part is uh, getting a, a unique identity, a biometric biometric identity. It takes three simple steps. Uh, and then you get uh, an account, uh, something with a bank. Uh, it's called No Frills Banking. Very, very, very easy to open, not a lot of documentation required. Uh, and then finally, you have uh, this QR code that's unique to you, each one. See hybrid CBDCs. You have China's EU one and you have Sweden's eKrona. This is already in place. It's already live. And then hopefully we'll see efficient cross-border payments. Uh, as I said, uh, for now it's Thailand, Hong Kong, China, the UAE, and the BIS. It's called the MCBDC bridge. You're gonna see fast payments uh, with financial inclusion. That's uh, Cambodia's Makong. That's India's. Jam Trinity, it's the Philippines, URPH. So if you look at all this, if you look at all this, there is something interesting, I think. All of these things uh, involve a trusted third party, whether it's banks, whether it's uh, the central bank. So as I said, the central banks have opted or the solution in which they give up on decentralization, full decentralization, and they go for security along with uh, along with the scalability and efficiency of payments. So let me end by uh, by citing Mark Twain. Mark Twain said uh, there were reports that he had died. And he said that those reports are greatly exaggerated. I think the same can be said about the trusted third party when it comes to payment systems. Thank you. That's uh, that's all I have. Thank Art. you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Remolona, for that very interesting uh, presentation. So uh, we'll go to our Q and A portion. So uh, when I call you, please identify yourself and your affiliation if you have any and um can you raise your virtual hand um uh, i i promised mon sarmiento that i would call him first because he has interesting questions in the chat then i call on renan paglinawan so mon if you could just unmute yourself hi can you hear me yeah hi Hi, I'm Ramon Sarmiento. I work with the Central Bank. I'm actually part of the group studying a Central Bank digital currency. Um, my first question is, the immutability of blockchain is good for security, but it has led to attacks focused on the holders of said blockchain or said coins. Um, they get a lot of phishing attacks and whatnot. Do you see policy or technology developments further improving security? Also, do you think the advent of common quantum computers undermining the security of blockchain? as it is designed now. Um, thank you, Mon. Uh, but first of all, Mon, can you confirm what I said about the BSP's uh, project? Well, it, more... well, we're studying it. We're studying uh, digital currency. We have a digital payments roadmap too, but I'm not very 
uh, comfortable talking about it. But I have other colleagues here who might be able to give you more information about that if you'd like to speak. If you'd like them to speak about it. But right now, as with most central banks, we are studying digital currencies. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the question about quantum computing, this will uh, greatly improve uh, computing power. Um, maybe. Right now, right now, uh, I think mining or the, this proof of work uh, process uh, consumes a lot of uh, energy. It uh, supposedly consumes uh, as much as the equivalent amount of energy that uh, that all the data centers around the world uh, consume, or half of what they consume. So it's a lot of energy just for this, uh, just for this mining business. Uh, the hacking issue, not not the Bitcoin itself. Uh, there have been fake Bitcoins. In Bitcoin, the the issue is more what they call the forks. Uh, uh, Sometimes you get uh, a proof of work that looks valid. But, uh, the second guy gets proof of work that looks valid, but it, but it's not, and that starts a whole other chain. Uh, but so far, this hasn't been a big issue because uh, the chains that start with, with forks are, I think, only go on for a few blocks and then they die. So the main chain seems to be uh, seems to be robust. Uh, so far, uh, we don't know because this is uh, probabilistic. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not uh, something that you can sh be sure about. The whole proof of work concept is uh, it's a stochastic process. There's a paper, by the way, by Bias and his colleagues at Toulouse, in which they model this as a stochastic coordination game, and that's what it is. That's really what it is. So you don't really. You can only say that this is reliable up to 99% or something like that. It's not going to be 100% reliable. As far as I know, as far as I know. Thank Was that your question? Did that answer all your questions? Come on, or? Uh, yeah. Um, second question. Uh, this is different from what I put in the chat. You mentioned cross-border payments as a incentive for uh, blockchains. How do you see concerns about privacy affecting this? Since um, privacy laws are basically geographically limited, you have the entire EU zone, which is like the transfer of data outside of their zone to be processed. How do you see this working hand in hand with cross border payments? Uh, it's going to be very important. The, the other project, the Project Stella, which is which involves the ECB and the Bank of Japan, it's. Um, the idea is they'll have a trusted auditor, as I said, but they also have what they call uh, privacy enhancement technologies. So that seems to be a very important part of the, the process. You have privacy, but also you want to be able to, uh, central banks are very concerned about this. You want to be able to prevent money laundering somehow, counter terrorist financing somehow. But you also have to protect the uh, privacy. So that's. Uh, that's a tricky, tricky business. The central banks are very serious about about this. Hi, uh, Renan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Renan, do you uh, hi. Uh, sure. Uh, this, uh, my name is Renan Pagrinao from S Metrics. Um, okay. My question is: uh, I, I want to revisit this issue about trilemma. Because uh, I think it's not a new problem, and uh, I think it will be uh, uh, in the context of uh, the latest technology. Maybe you can uh, we can try to assess what will happen. You know, the trilemma problem is not new. I mean, it existed with gold. Gold is decentralized, produced everywhere in the world, and it's trusted, but it's not scalable because it's very costly to transport. So, so the scalability problem of gold was has already been solved, and the solution was the invention of banks. Mm -hmm. So the bank would hold the gold, and since the bank held the gold, then the public would trust the bank. And instead of transferring gold, you would transfer checks, which actually in the early days represented the trusted asset, which was the gold. Okay, so uh, that 
solving the trilemma problem, we already saw the arc of that in, in the course of history. Now, what I'm saying is that you have a similar situation now. Uh, Bitcoin is competing with gold as a, uh, a trusted asset. And it's precisely it's competing with gold because it's decentralized and it cannot be, uh, it cannot be diluted because uh, no one can control the supply of gold, uh, of Bitcoin, just like no one can supply, uh, control the, well, you know, uh, the, the supply of gold is limited by the cost of mining, obviously, so we, we know that, okay. So, uh, but what I wanted to ask you, Dr. Remolena, is basically, um, and I'm not sure if I've been the people in this room are aware of this, but it's the cutting edge in the Bitcoin world, which is called the Lightning Network. Okay, so we know that uh, even if something is not scalable, like gold, it can it can to do it because my my phone is collateralized with bitcoin okay okay so uh the, i think the issue here is that if, if everybody can act like a bank and and the internet is much cheaper than, than swift what is going to stop this technology from making banks obsolete as far as the payment function only okay i'm not talking about the credit function I'm talking about the payment function of banks. Um, that's a complicated question, Renan, but let me, I agree with a lot of it. Uh, I like the analogy with gold, for example. Um, and as you said, gold doesn't move. Uh, in fact, a lot of it just sits in the vaults of the New York Fed. I used to uh, be assigned to visit that vault once a year as an officer of the New York Fed. I'm assigned to go and check the, out the gold. And the gold sits in cages in the five floors below the ground uh, the New York Fed. So if the Philippines will pay, is paying another country with gold, all they do is move the the, the bar of gold, uh, the right amount of uh, bars to another cage. It never leaves the vaults of the New York Fed. Uh, you're, paying, you're paying another country. So you're saying Bitcoin may end up being like that. It doesn't have to move. Uh, Bitcoin is about to reach its limit, it's supposed to be 21 million uh, Bitcoins, uh, and it's already 18 million Bitcoins. Uh, so at that point, you'd have a fixed amount of uh, Bitcoin, presumably. But remember, even with gold, uh, uh, gold became a kind of reserve asset, uh, it reserves in the vaults of uh, third party intermediaries. So then you, you still don't achieve what uh, Satoshi Nakamoto achieved, which is to get rid of all those third party intermediaries. So, so if Bitcoin behaves, is used the way gold evolved, uh, you still have the third party intermediaries. Uh, if Bitcoin becomes a reserve asset, we don't know whether it will, but if it becomes a reserve asset, then yes. Yeah, yeah, it will be, it will be, uh, you can't. You won't be able to get rid of intermediaries. I, I agree with that uh, because that's history has proven that's the only way to solve the scalability problem. The issue is the intermediaries is going to be, you potentially have a hundred million people who can get into the intermediary business. 
and and at no cost because they can do this in their cell phone. I mean, I I can charge like in order to move money from uh, Mr. A in India to Mr. B in Philippines, I can do that and I will charge uh, one billion of, uh, of one centavo. And I can still make money because the cost is so cheap to do it. So my question is if, if, the, if, the, uh, if the technology promises to democratize the intermediary business, what is going to save banks as financial intermediaries? I mean, there's no way they're going to compete with that cost structure. I, I, I don't know the answer to your question, Renan. I think it's an intriguing, it's an intriguing question. Uh, as you can imagine, there are many, uh, there are many pieces to consider in a, in a question like this. Uh, it's not something I've seen written about, um, but. Uh, it's a new thing. The Lightning Network is, uh, I think they, they just, uh, there are just a few uh, uh, proof of concept, but I think it's one of the most uh, exciting areas of this. Not Bitcoin as an asset, but Bitcoin as a network, which is a completely different dimension, but which I think is the one that will really be exploding. That's, uh, that's what's going to prevail, you think? Uh, Okay. I'll, I'll, well, yeah, there's just there's so much talent sure. going into this Bitcoin as a network. Yeah, but I don't I don't have an answer for you, Renan. But uh, thanks for the question because I'm gonna I'm gonna explore uh, the Lightning Network. But uh, I have no idea. Yeah. What, okay. Uh, Thank you, Doctor. Thing will work. Hi, Ali. Uh, there's a question from Maggie the Bukid Gonzalez. Uh, she claims that she has internet election problems, but are you here, Maggie, if you want to ask your question yourself? But if not, I'm just going to read her question. So she said that going back to Bitcoin, Rubini calls it a pseudo-asset, and at one point, a Ponzi scam that is fueled by speculation, etc. Do you agree with this view? And in relation to this, what's the use of cryptocurrency if it can't be used for transactions? If it's an asset, something to diversify your portfolio, what determines the asset value? How should central banks approach, handle, or treat such cryptocurrencies? Now, Maggie, that's a multi-part uh, question. Uh, by the way, I know Maggie very well, so I, I welcome, especially welcome the, the question. Uh, how will it work as a, an asset for diversification? So, one of the questions, I think. It's hard to say. It's hard to say because uh, even with gold, sometimes it's a good asset for diversification, so, but sometimes it's not. By the way, holding gold means you, on the average, you have a negative return. Uh, so it's costly to hold gold. Uh, and there's no underlying, uh, there's no underlying profit from holding, from holding gold. Uh, will the Bitcoin behave that way? I, it's anybody's guess. Um, so far, it's behaved like uh, a Ponzi scheme, as you suggested. Uh, if the first chap, there's a book. Uh, uh, this book by Robert Schiller, for example, looks at uh, narratives. Uh, that have led to bubbles and uh, bursting of bubbles. And Bitcoin is chapter one in the book. So it has elements of a, of a bubble and a Ponzi scheme. And, uh, it, and uh, if you read that first chapter, I think you'll get a sense of what, uh, what the narratives are. Part of it, by the way, is the mystique about Naka Satoshi Nakamoto because uh, he hasn't identified himself or herself uh, Few people know him, but most people don't know who, who he is. He's a mysterious, uh, it could be a group of people. So that, that's part of the mystique of, uh, the mystique of uh, Bitcoin. By the way, uh, Schiller has a graph that shows that the, the spread of Bitcoin looks very much like the spread of a pandemic. It's the same kind of uh, pandemic curve with Bitcoin. So that's why he thinks it's... Uh, it's kind of a Ponzi scheme, but uh, that's Robert Schiller. 
Dr. Oh, yeah. Well, they asked another question uh, uh, to Dr. Remulono. You know, uh, risk management, use of Bitcoin as hedging instruments uh, in the marketplace to, uh, you know, to write the volatility, to be able to um, optimize risk uh, positions uh, of dealers, uh, of various uh, currencies, securities, even commodities. Uh, would you see any use of Bitcoin, let us say, as a... Uh, underlying asset for derivatives, right? For example, if we know that uh, we're using options, we're using, uh, you know, all these uh, futures and uh, swaps. Uh, to Basically, we're using derivatives to hedge uh, our risks in as far as uh, interest rates, in as far as commodity prices, in as far as previous security prices are concerned. Would you see any opportunity, Dr. Arribulon, for, let's say, uh, uh, Bitcoin to be used as an underlying asset for the hedging of of risks, no? Maybe hedging of uh, price risks in the marketplace. Would that be exploited by banks? Maybe treasurers, uh, you know, because uh, we're, they're always looking for yield, for opportunities to take risks and make money. So I guess, uh, would you see that uh, moving forward, Dr. Rembolona, as a... I, I, I actually would see some of it. I, I don't see Bitcoin as a very good uh, hedging instrument by itself or even a diversification instrument by itself. Occasionally, it may work that way. But uh, I can see people issuing options, writing options uh, on Bitcoin. because It's such a volatile uh, asset that uh, options are almost a very attractive derivative for, uh, for uh, for Bitcoin, so it's, uh, I can see some derivatives, but uh, not, not the derivatives that you use for hedging, not so much. Not the Bitcoin swaps or not Bitcoin forwards, nothing like that. Thank you. Are there others who want to uh, comment or ask questions? Uh, I, I see Bobby Mariano here. Dr. Mariano, do you want to comment on the presentation? Or if you have any questions, we would like to hear your thoughts on this. It's close to midnight there. <laughs> uh, Bobby and I are at the same, the same time zone. I think I twisted, oh, okay. <laughs> I twisted yeah. Bobby's heart okay. to join this uh, discussion. Bobby, are you there? I'm just listening intently and a lot of interest, interesting issues. So, no, no particular question. Right? Oh. Thanks for joining, Bobby. We yeah. should have been soon. We're in the same city. Bobby and I are oh, really? both in the Philadelphia area. Oh, are you, are you in Philadelphia now, uh, Ellie? Yeah, I'm okay. still in Hamburg. Okay. <laughs> we should go to La Provence. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'll call on uh, I'll call on Corina Bautista first before I go to Mon. Uh, ah, okay. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just in my house dress, so I don't want to show my face. <laughs> but um, Ellie, I I, uh, I I like the way you presented this. Uh, Bitcoin as really not being a money uh, or performing the functions of money. It's really a speculative uh, instrument at this point. Um, the only other thing that I, you know, Bitcoin is one type of cri cryptocurrency. And uh, unlike an enterprise, Bitcoin has no business, no intrinsic value, no cash flows, no profit and loss statement, and no balance sheet. So it's really a speculative instrument and um, the one thing I wanted to say is that the technology behind Bitcoin, this blockchain technology actually provides anonymity to its players. Uh, in fact, Bitcoin is a favorite uh, with money launderers, tax evaders, terrorists, drug smugglers uh, and people who want to evade the law. Because many people who use uh, cryptocurrencies, I mean, they're not known. Uh, 
the players are not known. There's, so it, it provides this this technology provides a certain degree of anonymity uh, to them. And I think the question of whether central banks should issue digital currency is a separate issue from uh, what role uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin can play in um, you know maybe financial inclusion and 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 uh, and things like that and and uh, kind of um, uh, maybe reducing transactions costs but um, so I mean, what is the fascination with uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular among central banks uh, if at this point central banks know that Bitcoin use is not a challenge anyway at the moment to displacing fiat money uh, as as a medium of exchange, uh, as money, you know? So it, it might be, as you said, because um, uh, it might be uh, used to uh, a, a way to reduce uh, transactions uh, costs uh, and increase uh, financial inclusion. Uh, but at the moment, I, I, you know, I'm not sure um, what kind of uh, regulatory environment um, uh, is needed uh, to protect uh, investors in this in this Bitcoin thing in in the in the sense that uh, you know I don't know if all the investors are aware um, uh, that the you know the prices are extremely volatile that there's no, that Bitcoin doesn't have uh, intrinsic value um, and um, you know what is the role of the central bank in regulating that kind of activity. When it's not really, um, it, it's not really at the moment competing uh, as a money issued by uh, the central bank. So uh, that's not to say that the central bank should not be open to creating digital currencies. I mean, I noticed that the Economist um, has a special issue on, on digital currencies that matter. Get ready for Fed point and the euro. But I think that is a separate issue from uh from this idea that um uh you know that digital currencies can be used to expand uh, financial inclusion in some way and reduce by reducing transactions costs so it it's not it's not a money at the moment it doesn't function as a medium of exchange really or a unit of account or even store value um it is a speculative instrument, and I'm not really sure uh, what role the central bank uh, has to play in this kind of uh, uh, in this kind of scenario, and why it would be interested in uh, you know beyond well beyond protecting consumer uh, uh, interests. I, I don't know if that's really part of the role of the central bank. So I'm I'm kind of trying to think about why the central bank would be. Uh, interested in, in in thinking about ways to regulate uh, 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 the you know private transactions in Bitcoin. Um, so that that's that's all I had to uh, uh, contribute. I basically agree with you, Corina. Uh, people say it's uh, the anarchist's idea of money and. Uh, that's almost the same thing as saying it's the money launderer's idea of money. Uh, because all you need is a Bitcoin address. You, you right. have to identify right. yourself. You just need a computer and generate a Bitcoin address. And that's, uh, that's all you need. Um, what happened in terms of the way uh, central banks responded is they became aware of the blockchain technology. And they, it's a very impressive. Uh, Piece of uh, it's a very impressive uh, proposal by uh, Nakamoto, and so it forced central banks, I think, to take a harder look at, uh, at their, the payment system uh, to see whether blockchain can help. But the harder they looked, 
the more it became obvious that blockchain was not the solution to these problems. They, they had easier solutions, uh, extending the RTGS system, for example. I think that that may be what uh, what uh, the economist calls uh, Fed coin. Mm. Very easy solutions that were kind of uh, that they did see before, just because uh, they uh, they uh, they weren't. Uh, they had no incentive to look at them before blockchain, before, uh, before Bitcoin. But at the same time, uh, central banks are beginning to see other possible uses of blockchain, not for purposes of currency, but for smart contracts, for uh, yeah. artificial instruments. So these things uh, they're looking at, uh, there's the whole literature on uh, smart contracts based on blockchain, for example. So well, I think, yeah, I think one of the one of the things about Bitcoin is that because the supply is limited, um, it can't be debased, you know, and I think uh, that fact um, is a source of competition uh, with the uh, issue of fiat money by the central bank. So the central bank should uh, actually act more responsibly and make sure that uh, it doesn't debase its own currency by running inflation. Uh, on the blockchain technology, I think uh, one thing that I can think of a, a really good use for this technology in the Philippine case is um, to, you know, to, to record all transactions in the land registration authority and titling, yeah. and, you know, when you sell property and all that. Uh, I think this would be perfect. I mean, then we, we won't have this problems of you know when the when the register of deeds or the city hall burns down somewhere and all the records of uh, land transactions and titling are lost i think blockchain would be perfect for that you know yeah no, i agree i mean we need blockchain for land titles that's a that's a kind of a shady business in parts of the philippines yes i I haven't heard that before, uh, Corina, but, but I think it's a very good idea. Oh, that's the first thing that came to mind when I thought of blockchain. I mean, I mean, we, we, we of course, we worry about, uh, you know, cryptocurrency and all this. The, the, the uh, point of, uh, you know, raising trust, uh, you know, for any potential medium of exchange or in an asset like Bitcoin. Um, the problem is that you know, computer systems can be hacked, right? And we've seen that in the, you know, what happened with the Bangladesh bank uh, money laundered. I mean, it got laundered through a uh, through a local bank and all that. So, so that is all. That is still a problem with uh, these kinds of digital kinds of technology. So, that's another thing that might affect the, um, you know, the possibility that this digital currency. Uh, becomes more widespread and acceptable as both a medium of exchange and a and a store of value. So, um, you know, it works both ways, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Corina. Just uh, reacting to Dr. Butroko's point no? about ledger and recording of transactions. Uh, you know, if you have so many codes, if you have so many of these... Uh, you know, a verification, the need for an auditor becomes important. And as just a, as a matter of fact, I think uh, some banks now are using the ledger system. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, blockchain ledger system as an underlying, uh, you know, uh, what I call platform for their, for their uh, digital banking. I know for one, if I may say, I think Union Bank is already using that. As, uh, they're using employing blockchain, I think, for their ledger technology. So it is not just really the negative side, as you mentioned, for speculators and hedgers and, you know, uh, you know, for cyber criminals uh, using the, this, uh, you know, Bitcoin for, uh, you know, for uh, moving money. Uh, but I think there are very positive, and I agree with you, use of this blockchain, uh, for, uh, this kind of ledger uh, for uh, purposes of having... A more accurate, more independent, and of course, uh, there are need for miners to really validate this transaction because uh, you, you you don't have to depend on just uh, one intermediary. You depend maybe in several. 
uh, several, as you mentioned, uh, you, you need a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, miners and the, those who would validate the transaction in the flip of a, in the flip of a, of a second. Or, you know, you know very well that uh, that could be very positive, could have an impact on the economy, you know, and could have, uh, could really increase, uh, you know, the, the uh, productivity of, uh, you know, of not only financial institutions, but also those users of this, uh, of, of uh, consumer, you know, digital banking services. So I guess uh, as we move towards more uh, uh, online uh, banking, online financial services, we would realize that Bitcoin, or rather the uh, use of blockchain ledger would be very potent. So it should be encouraged. Uh, it should, uh, the BSP always encourages something that is positive because it will mean a bigger financial inclusion. It will mean more financial inclusion for uh, for the country. So I guess uh, let us look at the positive side of this, uh, you know, this blockchain technology as a driver of uh, business in our uh, economy. And that will benefit a lot of uh, uh, consumers and that will mean more financial inclusion. So I guess uh, thank you for that, uh, Professor Kuchok and of course, uh, Dr. Lemono. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for two more questions, but I'll allow Mon. Uh, is that a new raised hand? Yes, yes. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, given the fact that we have very strict LBMA rules, uh, London Bullion Market Association rules, do you see that this is having any effect on the shift from gold to blockchain, or is there any study on this? Uh, because you like to mention that this is the anarchist idea of money, which would seem very similar to gold before. <laughs> uh, I don't know the the gold bullion rules of. Uh, is that a new thing? Uh, the London gold bullion rules. Well, it's not that new. I'm, I'm not sure when it came about when it's being enforced, but for it to be part of your. Um, your gross international reserves, you generally have to comply with London Bullion Market Association. Uh, uh, uh. It's sort. It's similar to the um, conflict fee diamond rules. No child labor use, not stolen. Uh, okay, 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 okay. No, sorry, I, that, uh, I wasn't aware of those rules. They seem to make sense. Oh, well, so thank you then. Okay, we, it's pushing near midnight at Ellie's place, so if you have, we, we have only room for one question. Uh, does anyone else have a question or comment? Uh, if there are none, uh, join me in uh, giving Dr. Ellie Remolona a virtual round of applause. Uh, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to hear your lectures. Dr. Remolona, and I hope that we can count on you to to present in the future. And uh, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you too. Thank you, Ali. I think we can do a bit of collaboration on topics like this. I'll just I'll just uh, stop the recording so we can uh, we can do all our juicy comments uh, without <laughs> without uh, <laughs> fear. Okay, so. I'll just stop this. So thank you, everyone, and we'll see you on our next uh, uh, UPSC PCED seminar. But stay around if you want to chit-chat with Dr. Ellie.